Welcome to the Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Atchison. We're doing something a little different today. Our guest is someone who is in his mid-90s and has lived a life beyond what most of us could imagine. We really hope you enjoy uh, the interview with Angus Hamilton and his stories, adventures, and wisdoms. Well, thank you so much for inviting us into your home. You're welcome indeed. And, um, so you're already, in a way, a collector of stories from, <laughs> from doing your book, the, the Canadians on Radar and that story. Do you mm. want to walk us a little bit? And three others. Through it? Yes, and then the other ones too. It's yeah. all family stories. Yeah. So can we start with the Canadians right. on Radar? Because y you had a, a whole journey to do to capture years later what the experiences were for a forgotten group. Right. Yeah, there was, um, I guess I need a little background on World War II. Uh, it's not generally known that radar was sometimes described as the decisive weapon of World War II because the, with the use of uh, radar the, in the Battle of Britain, the small number of fighters that the British had was able to defeat the armada of bombers that the Germans were sending over. And this, Hitler had to change his plans. He was going to invade England, but he had, they had to destroy the Air Force first and they couldn't do it. And the reason they couldn't do it was because the radar was um, guiding the planes so they were using, making ma maximum use of their time. Uh, <clears throat> And the British realized they needed far more radar, and they, they could produce the equipment, yeah. but they needed the People. technicians to keep it going because it was the old-fashioned vacuum tube technology that, like electric, like light bulbs, that they burnt out and there was other things went wrong, kept a lot of maintenance, and the British needed skilled people. They called Canada first for volunteers who had uh, radio repair experience or amateur radio people, and they got several hundred, but that wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. So they initiated a program to, um, at the universities to take young men that had high school, completed high school or almost all of high school, and they could give them a crash course and send them overseas to fill this gap. So uh, I was in on that first wave of that group. And that was in and around when, 1940, 19, 41? I joined up in the spring of 41. 41. And how old were you then? I was just turned 19. My goodness. And you were off on a major life adventure. I was, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was at a time when people didn't travel because, you know, I knew one person that had been overseas and, you know, there was a, for time, and one person that went to Florida in the winter, and you know people stayed close to home. Mm -hmm. So the the idea of being able to travel just was a real uh, just appeal to me, and I, I uh, took the most of it. Do you remember the journey over? Hmm? Do you remember the all trip too over? well? <laughs> Can you describe it for us? Yes, because we were went over we were assembled in a, what they call Y Depot in Halifax. It's still a military base in the pretty well center of Halifax. And in November, and Halifax in November is not a sunny, cheerful place. And the news coming in every, almost every day was the number of ships that had been sunk in the North Atlantic. And we knew that in a few days, we were going to be on a ship in the North Atlantic. It was not a reassuring thought, no. but as it turned out, we needn't have worried because <clears throat> the, Na the British Navy, with help from the Canadian Navy, had uh, an excellent convoy system. And the, I think there was eight or nine ships in the convoy, and there were corvettes, destroyers, and a cruiser protecting us, and uh, in fact, there was never a, there were no, I don't know of any losses of troop ships during World War II. 
Uh, one of my friends was on a, a ship that was uh, torpedoed in the Mediterranean, but they all got off and he got to North Africa. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, that, but when we were in Halifax, we didn't know that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> anyway, that was, uh, and it was all up, all uh, very positive from there on, really. Great. How, how many of you were on one of those troop ships? I don't know the total number of troops. It was a 20,000 ton ship. I don't know. There was, I think, 60 in our group, but we were, there were many groups. Different groups. And, um, and how many days? Seven or eight, I think. Eight or nine. I'm not, I, I have it in my notes, but I, can't, I don't have it in my head. Um, you're from Ontario originally? That's right, yeah. Um, seasick? Hmm? Did you get seasick? No, nope, no. I have a good, uh, <laughs> good stable system. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. The, uh, that whole role that radar played in World War II, and you were in the middle of all of that. Mm -hmm. So decades later, you come to write a book gathering the stories of, uh, I believe you called the section, Those Who Were There. Yeah, it was, uh, <clears throat> there were about five or six thousand Canadians on radar, almost all seconded to the Royal Air Force. and. Uh, so about seven, 725 of these, or 23, were sent to Southeast Asia. And we were, all the, all the radar mechs were a little bit scattered, mm -hmm. but we were far more scattered because we were spread all the way from Karachi in uh, the west of India to, right to the, well, before the Japanese involved, there were some that were in uh, Singapore and in uh, who some quite a few of them got uh, were captured and yeah. uh, I have a chapter on that in the book. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, it was uh, we were scattered quite often, just one or two Canadians on a British unit. Mm -hmm. I was with a squadron that had uh, quite a, a larger group of Canadians. There was always about at least a dozen of us on the squadron I was on, but. Um, the, uh, some of those chaps were, you know, just completely <laughs> uh, away from all their familiar contact. And, and yeah. So they're completely in a, uh, alien in a foreign land. <laughs> well, yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Anyway, so they were very glad to have the story put together. Hmm. How many years later did that start to surface, or decades later? Did it, was it in the 80s or 90s? 90s. Early 90s, uh, oh, uh, there was a, ch a chap in Ottawa who had been, uh, he was an engineer, but he'd been in the bu bureaucracy to some extent, knew how the system worked. And he started needling the uh, history department of uh, national defense and of the veterans unit, or the history, I think it's just the history of na department of national defense. and we, as I mentioned before, he, uh, they said, well, no, we're, we're not, <laughs> you wouldn't do anything for you. Yeah. You weren't with a Canadian unit. And uh, he started stirring things, and two or three, several of us had been thinking along the same lines, and he uh, wrote letters to the newspapers asking veterans to send them information, mm -hmm. and he built up quite a large archive and um, I was going at a business that took me through Ottawa, and I arranged to have a breakfast meeting with him and asked him what he was going to do about the Southeast Asia group. And he said, "Oh, well, I don't know." <laughs> so I said, "Do you mind if I would you mind if I uh, sort of worked on it?" He said, "No, I'd be delighted." And uh, so he t and. Quite a little while later, he turned over his the data, all the files he had on Southeast Asia to me, and I took it from there and uh, put this book together. Um, do you mind explaining what it was like to find out that um, somewhere in the military structure they weren't capturing your story? It's like, oh no, you, you guys don't count because, <laughs> you know, that spirit, after I already identifying a key element, you know, probably the central element to the victory mm -hmm. was the use of radar. Um, 
it, it must have been off-putting to know. A little and bit. A, and the little joke, I meant it in a gentle way, but you know, you people were off the radar. That's for, right. For That's right. And, and it's so ironic. And, yeah. and then to have the energy to pull the stories yeah. up so yeah. we have them today. Yeah. What was that like? What did it. Hmm. Oftentimes you hear in the military stories of, uh, oh, we've used you up and, and now we're done with you. <laughs> we don't need you anymore. Yeah. Was it a bit of that? Uh, to some extent, I guess. Uh, but we weren't hard done by in the sense that we'd, we had negligible casualties. Uh, you know, we were support staff. We were, uh, mm -hmm. uh, most, many of us were on a squadron, including the grounds crew on the squadron. Well, rarely did a, any, you know, the air crew were the ones that had the, took the risks and had the losses. But um, it was still, we were still making a contribution to the to the uh, the air crew couldn't function without the ground crew. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, it, it, uh, as I say, the I got I have a, a wonderful file of feedback. Hmm. If my morale's a little low, I go reread it, and it's just a, a real uh, booster good. shot. Yeah, yeah great. Because that was the next thought I had was. There must be some great stories in there of where the work of your your tribe mm. um, made a difference in saved lives and brought people back home safely. Do you have any stories like that where a mission went out or an event occurred and the difference was that the people uh, managing the radar systems and maintaining the radar systems um, were, were how the day was saved? No, that it doesn't work out that way. The the, okay. the main role of radar is defensive, okay. well, picking picking up enemy aircraft coming in. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the war went on and we began moving forward, the radar became less and less significant oh, because there's nothing, you know. The as the enemy, uh, I was with the the Burma campaign, but the. Jap the, the Allies, the mainly the British in, in the Burma campaign, had the air superiority, and there weren't many Japanese attacks. <clears throat> There's one sort of dramatic story. When I first got to Calcutta, <clears throat> there were no, there was no. I was on night fighters, and there were no night fighters there. But in December of 1942, the Japanese sent. Uh, small two or three bombers over with some small bombs uh, in the daytime and dropped them on the port. And the damage was trivial, but the uh, psychological effect was enormous. Hmm. An estimated half a million people had headed back to their villages, clogged the roads and left all these the semi-skilled jobs unfilled. The garbage piled up was the most obvious <laughs> effect. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> then <clears throat> um, in, uh, in January of 43, they sent some uh, night bombers over, and that really upset things. And uh, <clears throat> I guess it was a high command decision that uh, to send half of a night fighter squadron from the Middle East to Calcutta. <clears throat> the first night the squadron was there, the junior pilot, who was a flight sergeant, was assigned night duty, and everything worked. The ground radar picked up some Japanese bombers coming in. They vectored him in behind the bombers. His, the, his, his radar, the airborne radar worked. His radar upper navigator uh, picked up the bomber, directed him into ideal firing position, and he shot down three in four minutes. And uh, was the, sort of the hero of, uh, yeah. uh, of the day. Yeah. But that was, it was just small dramatic th th things. There weren't many of those, but some yeah. of them were dramatic and decisive. Great. You had a precipitating moment or 
a pivot point in a life where <laughs> it went this way instead of that way? And uh, I don't know of any specific moments. Things sort of evolved more or less. I'm not a uh, dramatic person, I guess. Uh, I sort of reason things out and, yeah, okay, yeah, I guess we'll do that. Okay. So, um, part of your story is a, a long tenure at University of New Brunswick in, um, in your professor emeritus, I believe, yeah. in the research. Uh, they've changed the title of the faculty, Geomatics and Geo... Ge uh, Geodesy and Geomatics Engineering. Geodesy. It was surveying engineering when I was there, yeah. yeah. And I wasn't a long-term faculty member. I was only there for 15 years. Only 15. My, my <laughs> previous career had been uh, with natural, uh, natural Resources in Ottawa, okay. doing surveys in the Arctic a lot of the time. In the Arctic? Yeah. My goodness. You went from hot to cold. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, oh, I want to explore that. So the Arctic, there's been, science today tells us of the many changes in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. um, do you follow that at all? And do you oh, yeah. see those same changes? Yeah, I give, I've given a couple of talks on the Arctic. In 2009, my wife and my daughter and I took a, went on one of the cruises, that you can take a 10-day cruise around some of the, and it happened, this cruise happened to stop at some of the places that I'd worked 50 years ago. So I did a talk called, uh, uh, I think none of it revisited mm -hmm. and compared the conditions when I was there 50 years ago to the to what we were seeing in 2009. And? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> the whole, the ships, the ice conditions hadn't changed significantly from 100 years ago when Franklin's ships were trapped. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was basically no significant navigation through the Arctic Islands. And uh, this was in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And we were on a cruise ship that was making scheduling trips and stopping at points. And they could schedule this, not just yeah. depending on the they They might, they put a caveat in that, well, the weather, weather might not permit us to get in, but they did. And uh, so this was just the change that in the 50 years. My goodness. I know mainstream media will often cover a story about the reduction of the polar ice cap. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. In social media, Facebook, there was a feed yeah. just last week uh, showing mm -hmm. a time lapse. Yeah. And it, you see the ice cap kind of move through a season and move through a year, but then you saw decades of that evolve. Yeah. And, and from where it was in the 50s to today is a huge difference. Yeah. So mm -hmm. do you... Uh, I, do you believe that climate change exists? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot, you know, there's certain people that still have doubt. And, yeah. And you have hands-on experience. Well, and all they need to do is go to the Arctic and talk to some of the old the people that have been there a long time. No, there's no, no question about the uh, change. The cause is not quite as certain, but it's, it's I, I'm, being a, having a science background, I'm, quite satisfied that it, that it is. I know how science works and uh, mm. ideas get pounded around. If an idea can't be confirmed, it's thrown out. Yep. And uh, you know, that's, that's a very uh, a, a bad idea just can't survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. Not to wander into politics completely, but the major shift in the United States with their recent election um, and stuff in the media every day, um, one element of that is the climate change and the United States changing its policy and direction on accepting climate change, opting out of the Paris Accord. And, <laughs> um, thoughts? Because you, you have a life's journey connected to the world and hot and cold and, <laughs> and science so it's provable or it's um, yeah. acceptable, you know, you can reach consensus of some sort. And then that curve thrown in, do you have any thoughts about how are we going to sustain the changes we need when the politics want to take these hard turns every now and then? Well, the, the good news from the states is that uh, the cities in California are just 
they're on they're they're the one the prime movers anyway. Okay. And uh, you know the the top makes the department of, what the Department of Environment does has some influence, but uh, <coughs> as uh, <coughs> I like the quote that uh, Harry Truman made when Eisenhower was appointed uh, was taking over as president. Truman said that Ike, was, of course he'd been the supreme commander in World War II, he said Ike uh, has been in a position where and he gave an order and a million men moved. He said he's going to find in this office that he gives an order and absolutely nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's, quite a, that's there's quite a lot of truth in that. Yeah. So uh, no, they, it's a slow process, but uh, even in Canada, you know, there's lip service and there is slow progress, but uh, I'm not sure. I study climate a bit. In fact, uh, somewhere in the room I have graphs of climate for the last half million years. And it does change, and the changes are not fully understood. Presumably attribu attributable, well, they're certainly attributable to the sun. Mm -hmm and how much sunshine we're getting and so on. And uh, that process really isn't fully understood. So uh, whether this, uh, to what extent uh, change can, w things we can do can make a change, I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> so that would tie to some of the Current policies by governments on carbon taxes and well, certainly it's, it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's a good idea, and we have to. There's there's other reasons for doing those things. Pollution, for one thing, mm -hmm. and uh, just although the <clears throat> currently there's a glut of oil, there's still a limited amount of oil in the earth, and you know, and it will run out. And there's no there's no alternative to it really. Not yet, especially so, as the world's population yeah. doubles. So slowing down the use of oil is a good thing to do in every respect, and hopefully, uh, you know, it'd be nice to be for the earth to be completely sustainable from an energy point of view. Might happen. It'd be great if it did. Yeah. <laughs> it would be great if it did. Yeah. Um, can we turn into some family stories? All right. Because you have a, a, a nice sized family. Do you want to talk about that side of your journey? Ancestor, married children? Ancestors or children? I had children. Uh, we had five children. And uh, <clears throat> we've had some, we've lost two. Uh, we lost a son to schizophrenia in 1993. And our youngest daughter to cancer in 1999. Uh, the daughter had three boys and they were all doing well. Very, still in the, they're all in uh, New Brunswick and, and doing all graduates and uh, one, well one's still in medicine and in St. John, to the, the other two are working in Fredericton. And uh, <coughs> we have uh, two grandchildren, we have the other, well, there were three surviving children. One is living in Fredericton, one in Ottawa, and one in Vancouver. And uh, the one in Vancouver, the son has two children, and they're adventurous, <laughs> like the others, <laughs> several of us in the family. <laughs> one is currently in Australia, in the love of pursuing the love of his life, and the other is in Greece, uh, volunteering with the Syrian refugees. So uh, we we're very happy with our family. We got. Uh, just a, they're uh, good people, caring people, yeah. adventurous people. Yeah. Uh, they like to, um, just had a call from our son in Vancouver, who's, you know, he's in his 60s, but just done a 100 mile bicycle race. Uh, the temperature was 104 degrees Fahrenheit at one point. <laughs> So there's a, some squid. He's got a lot of stamina. <laughs> uh, so we uh, we have an active family. Yes. Do you have um, some thoughts on fatherhood and being a father? 
Do you have some teachings you could share with us? <laughs> well, I feel sorry for any man that doesn't have daughters. <laughs> <laughs> I have, we have three, and one of them we've lost, but uh, daughters, uh, I have a, just a wonderful relationship with my daughters. They just bring joy into my life, and, uh, and daughters, Comes to tend to come, stay part of the family. Sons, what's the old expression? Uh, a daughter's a daughter for life, a son's a son till he gets a wife. <laughs> and you know, sons tend to, women tend to establish the social fabric. And it was very strong in my mother's family. You know, there were seven girls and one boy. And the seven girls remained close friends all their lives. Uh, when the telephones came in, they began talking to each other once, almost once a week. And that's the subject of the latest book that uh, I just finished there. The green one? The green one, yeah. This one. But it's the, uh, the closeness of that family. And uh, <clears throat> it's, um, it demonstrates, well, it makes the point that daughters uh, keep a family together, generally. I mean, <laughs> there, are, there are exceptions to that rule. I can cite some, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, my experience it is that uh, daughters keep a family together. And in your life's journey, you would have um, experienced a lot of the transitions about the role of males. Yeah. <laughs> From, you know, the World War II stories and then going through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, <laughs> the feminist movement, yeah. um, impact yeah. on men. We often hear the stories from the female perspective. We don't often <laughs> hear those social change stories from the male perspective. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts uh, about, <laughs> you know, what, what, you, what you lived through? <laughs> well, for me it's been great because uh, uh, I w w Margaret and I married in 1949, and we adopted the traditional roles. She would be the homemaker and caregiver, and as I put it, I would make a living and she'd make it worthwhile. And it's worked. We've had a wonderful relationship, and it's still wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> Mind you, she didn't just sit at home, she volunteered. When we were living in Ottawa, she became an elected member of the school board, which was elected on a citywide basis. And in Ontario, the school boards have some power. They have, a, they have taxing authority and spending authority, and uh, it was a very, she was a, had quite a high profile career there. And then when we came here and we bought this place, she operated in the orchard. We had, it was a U-pick orchard, or orchard, and she made it the most prominent U-pick in the Fredericton area. And um, then she started a bed and breakfast and did that. Made it the best, the first, and one of the first, and one of the best bed and breakfasts in the Fredericton area. So she had a career, but not a job in the. Yeah nine to five sense of the word. Nowadays they call that being an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and when that phrase first yeah. came up, I thought, wait a second, people have been doing this for a long time. Yeah. It just has a new label. But it was nice because uh, I was bringing in the bed and bread and butter and, and she was doing things that enriched both our lives because I, I benefited, benefited from many of the things that she did. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was, I'm very happy. I, I don't, <clears throat> I think feminism has feminism has gone too far. For one thing, the fertility rate in Canada is 1.6. The replacement rate is 2.1, and it, it's going to take women quite a while to figure this out. That they're that the, to a large extent they're responsible for this, and the whole society has to put a lot more emphasis on motherhood. Motherhood should be considered the highest role in society. Being president of a corporation is trivial compared to being a good mother. And we've lost sight of that. And it's, um, and of course, that's part of the problem. And that's why we're having immigrants, so many immigrants, and, and uh, uh, immigrants are good, we're all immigrants, but uh, 
it's not a not a good way to go. Yeah, because currently we're seeing immigration as a solution to a problem yeah, rather than going to the core. Of the, the traditional issue. method, right? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. How about the role for you as as father as dad? Did you find it changed? Um, with uh, dispensing advice or um, having the big arms to keep everybody safe, you know, <laughs> and h how that shifts or uh, passing on wisdoms nowadays? I don't know. It's, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, I think that's a personal matter. What if, what if you know, the, it's what the father does and the kind of person he is. If uh, some I think there should be much more emphasis on it, more credit to, to good fathers. They're, you know, athletes get all sorts of awards and, and uh, in addition to the fancy salaries, but people that do the most important things of family and uh, there's no, no, not even any awards for them. Uh, well, they, they get the reward of, uh, yeah. of uh, the happiness that goes with it. Yeah. but. Uh, the, 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 public, the public doesn't, you know, yeah. youth don't see it quite that way. The social recognition. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess that's where I was trying to head with the question, is that the role of men have changed so much that um, some younger men might say that it was hard for them to have a role in raising the children. Mm. Um, there's lots of studies now about absentee fathers, for example, and yeah. the, the notion of the sacred male, because you spoke nicely of the divine feminine. And then with that comes the sacred male. And when we put those two energies together, really good things happen. Yeah. No, it's it's a you know it's a proven model going back to the, the Old Testament and even you know it's well there was polygamy in uh, the early times, but uh, they still put a lot of emphasis on family and the responsibility of the father. In the Jewish faith, it's it's a lot of pressure on a man to get married. If he's not married by the age what at age thirty or something, he's uh, he's sort of uh, outcast, outcast almost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, no, it's um, that's. Uh, on the other hand, um, I at the launch for this book last week in Ontario, uh, one of the um, families that are the let's see. Next generation. Uh, people are now in their 60s, but she was a, a very good teacher and enjoyed it. And her husband became, it was basically a house husband. And she was the primary breadwinner. They still had four children, raised them well. And uh, he did other things, but you know, in the, on the entrepreneurial volunteer level. And it worked very well, so uh, that uh, that that model can work too. Mm -hmm. To change tack a little bit, um, technology has changed an awful lot. <laughs> yes, you know, uh, even me trying to remember the name of uh, survey engineering into <laughs> geomatics and geo science. Geo geodesy and geomatics. Geodesy. Yeah. <laughs> when I see geodesy, I always think of Odyssey and then go to Jules Verne. <laughs> right. Um, so do you want to speak a bit to changes in technology? Because um, it's, it's shifted everything and you will have experienced the full range. Yeah, it, it's um, there's being my, my edu formal education was in, in engineering physics, which is half engineering and half science. So I'm, and my career has been somewhat the same. I worked in the first um, decade in basically an engineering job type job, still surveying, but in the engineering side. Then I worked a decade in the science side, measuring gravity and, and uh, understanding, uh, you know, the doing research in, in, uh, in that field. Uh, <clears throat> and then at, at, uh, when I was chair of the department at UNB, I had both st uh, faculty, had, had some, some were science, some were, we were focusing on the engineering. And I was in a good position, of course, because I understood both sides very well. Uh, <clears throat> and they all have their, their role, and it's great. <clears throat> um, I guess I'm a little apprehensive, if you like, 
there's Mel, I think there's different uh, analysis, but more scientists practicing now than there have than there than all the previous science put together. Uh, China and especially is just thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of them. Uh, and I just somehow I feel it's going too fast. In other words, um, where are they going? Where, how far can they go that, that is really beneficial to, to, the, to the world, to society at large? And I, I don't see the answer to that, and that's not one that's being discussed very much, but it's uh, uh, I get a magazine called Discover, which reports on the uh, advances in many fields. I know the way that one of the fields, of course, the genomic study of the human geno genome, and I think that's the way to pronounce it. And uh, it's explaining so many things, wonderful. But again, it, it's opening the door to um, problems that, <laughs> we're going, that we may not be able to cope with. Yeah. Do you have any personal stories the first time you started to use computers? <laughs> um, Did you have stacks of those cards that you had to feed? Oh, yes, the yes, yes. In fact, uh, my contact with computers goes back to 1950-51 when I was doing a master's in Toronto uh, and I, uh, uh, two or three of my colleagues, we'd meet in a, uh, one of the lab rooms for, with a for our lunches and the two men working, uh, the, the part of this general group that met, were the first two researchers in Canada to be working on computers. And uh, the names, ironically, were rats and cats. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, and very soon the rooms we were in were taken over by the University of Toronto bought a Farut, which was the, an English computer that took all one side of the hall in the physics, in this uh, floor of the physics department to house this computer, which uh, of course couldn't do as much as uh, the simplest uh, uh, as your cell phone nowadays. Mm -hmm. But uh, so uh, <coughs> uh, I sort of have grown up with uh, the, with the computing, and uh, because I was working in the late fifties, early sixties. I was in uh, surveying and also in gravity when we needed a lot of computing, good old-fashioned uh, calculations. calculations. Yeah. I spent more hours than I care to think of with uh, what we called a marchant, you know, a ten-digit ten keyboard. You keyed in and you pressed a pulled a lever and you keyed in some more and. There were, it took forever to do a, a, a job now that is done in seconds. Uh, and of course, by the time I came to UNB in the 70s, it was, it had taken over and begun to expand into, out of the computing field. Mm -hmm. But because we, uh, surveying has a lot of computing, we were the first to be big users of the computer at UNB. Uh, and of course now it's the arithmetic work, to do, what you call computing, is a minor part of what a computer does. Mm. So it's, uh, I must admit, I, uh, I, I use it uh, every day. Yep. I keep lists of things. My memory's not great. I keep lists of all sorts of things on the computer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, I like email because I can go back and look and what did so and so say when. And, yeah. uh, no, it's uh, 
It's better than having a thousand sticky notes all over oh, the wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my writing is not great, so uh, no, I uh, appreciate it. And um, can can we slide back into that? You were touching a bit on artificial intelligence, and, and what's the purpose of all of this, and where it's going? <laughs> um, do you have a sense that, uh, from your perspective, are we losing something? Are we losing a connection with each other? Are we losing the ability to know how to do some things? I don't know. Uh, you know, we, when we stop and think of it, you know, you just using the microwave and everything else, sure, there's a little bit of computing in all of it, and almost every everything we use, the car. You, uh, but, uh, yeah, again, it's the same, uh, there is a potential for evil, if you like, in this, in the AI, the, the fact that you know, somebody that controls a very powerful AI system, um, it's it's uh, concern certainly. Yeah. yeah, there was a fascinating interview with Charlie Rose with a gentleman who worked on the Watson project for mm -hmm. IBM, mm -hmm. and he explained with much enthusiasm because that's what he does. And that's his world, uh, about how the computer makes its own calculations, its own thoughts, mm. rather than it's only based on what the humans put in. Right, the, machine. Yeah, yeah. the machine now can figure out its own complex problems without any human input. Mm -hmm. um, when I he heard that, my hair went up on the back of my neck a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder, I don't have near your history and experience with those. I thought, oh my goodness, are we at some sort of risk? And only those with a lifetime of experience would see that risk, because yeah. everyone else is all caught up in how exciting it all is. Yeah, yeah, it, it's um, worrisome, I guess is the word I would use. Uh, and the political events, or the way some things are going, uh, you go back in history, back to the Old Testament or even back to the uh, few hundred years uh, before democracy, except for the Greek experiment, mm. uh, the world was under the rule of dictators, basically. Mm -hmm. China, of course, is the oldest and uh, most stable economy, or stable society, but uh, They've been under the uh, emperor. Emperor, yeah, uh, sort of considered that uh, he ruled, basically ruled the world. And when uh, you know, somebody came to visit him, he sort of was courteous and you know. Uh, but uh, he, there was certain people had their roles, and he had his. Uh, Mandarins keeping things under control, and, yeah. and uh, you know, go, by, go to the other side of the world, the Persian Emperor, um, the, I'll go back into biblical times, the Assyrian Emperor, and of course Ro we all know about the Roman Emperor. So, uh, so you're afraid we might slide into... We seem to be sliding into that, and the technology and will support it, unfortunately, tends to be, the internet was originally Yes. So, so to help democracy, but in many ways it's it's working the other way, especially with Trump and his tweets. Uh, so it's it's. Uh, yes. We may I, hard to maybe a little selfish, but there's, we may have lived through the last best lifetime <laughs> that it's possible that you know that. Obviously, our lifetime was my lifetime was better than my ancestors, which I've in many ways, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it may well be better than my descendants in many ways. So, some of the early indicators are there from yeah. social research, you know, yeah. life expectancy, and yeah. a few other indicators. Um, we have probably five minutes or so left. Um, can we flip this a little bit? And um, what? What is joyful in your world? What what has brought you joy in your life? Okay. Um, you touched a bit on it with family. But yeah. 
Oh, a few years, quite a while ago, I sat down and went, what do I enjoy? What do I, because you know, I'm, I've been retired for a long time, I'm comfortable financially and family. I thought two things that bring me satisfaction are learning and creating. And it's uh, when I went, thought back, that had been guiding me for a long time, but I had not, not consciously. And when I thought about it, I thought, okay, and now I sort of bring that in and more consciously that <laughs> has this got some learning value or some creating value? And uh, it works. I, uh, the garden is creative. You know, you plant something and up comes something. Um, putting a good uh, story together is creative. Doing these books brings has brought me a great deal of satisfaction. So um, anyway, I don't know whether that answers your question or not. No, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful because yeah. those are lifetime journeys. Yeah. Um, when did when did that sh catch you? When did you catch on to you know your <laughs> light bulb went on? It's like this is what I really do. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's uh, like I've been puzzling over when when I uh, articulated that to myself, but it's in the you know in the last twenty or 30, twenty odd years or so. Yeah. Great. Any thoughts to close us out? Well, it's been the most interesting discussion, and I, I enjoy a wide-ranging discussion. From uh, you know, to my, part of my challenge in life was to understand how the world works. And, uh, uh, I'll never get there, but it's been a great <laughs> journey. Uh, I have one more thought. Just popped in when I asked the question about closing out. Um, do you have any thoughts on the role of elders in today's society? Um, not particularly, because it's, um, first of all, there's a lot more of us than there used to be, because uh, you know, people didn't live much past their, their uh, working life. Uh, I think it's, a, it's probably going to have to evolve as to what the, a, a new role for elders needs to be found because you're going to have people with, in fact, uh, <clears throat> this morning when I was picking berries, a neighbor came up and spoke to me and we arranged to get together, but uh, he's 15 years younger and he's been already been retired 15 or 20 years, you know, and uh, this didn't used to happen, you know. Uh, the number of people that uh, had a long uh, retirement, you could, and you could name everybody you knew when I was young. Now, there's a whole lot more of us. So, no, I think that there's, there needs to be a lot of thought into finding something to do. I plan for old age from the time I was 21, and uh, <clears throat> the story on that is that. I was on leave on a tea garden after I'd had malaria, yeah. and uh, of course it was a great life. The, the planter's house, was, you know, spacious house, two or three servants, and, and uh, uh, everything was just a great way of a wonderful place for all to leave for me. And uh, it was in the afternoon, it'd be a happy hour. We'd be sitting around chatting, and I asked the our host, my host, what did he have plans for retirement? He said, "Well, it doesn't matter. So we might go to Kenya, we might go to the south of England, we might go to Vancouver Island." He said, "It doesn't matter. We only live about a year because they lived in a high-stress job, 24/7, responsible for. He had a thousand coolies and a thousand acres of tea. They lived in the center of the plantation." And you know he was, and uh, of course he's been had sub, had had malaria many times and so on. Anyway, uh, I was I thought wait a minute, I don't, I want to for one thing I want to I don't want to stop work suddenly. And uh, and it's happened and it's fairly common that people, dynamic people, stop suddenly and they their system just doesn't take the change. So I and that was one of my 
rationale for coming to New Brunswick, to the UNB, because, to the university, because at the university you can phase out, you know. I was basically ten, it was eight or ten years fully retiring from, uh, from formal work. And I planned, uh, gathered up information for these books that I would write in my old age, which I was never sure I would do, but as it turned out, I've done uh, especially the, uh, the two there that, uh, but I started gathering information for them 50 years ago on the, you know, on the thought that, well, I might get it into a book, but it'd be useful to gather it anyway. And uh, as it turned out, uh, uh, the good Lord's been kind to me, and uh, I've been able to get them uh, get these finished. So, anyway, that's uh, uh, my approach to aging. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. I hope it's of some use to your project. <laughs> it will be. Okay, good. Thank you for watching. Um, the Dennis Report counts on your support. So all through this video, you would have seen in the top right corner and a little icon you could click. Support the show through Patreon. Hope you do. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.